So, Ricky, thanks for having us around. Yeah, it's great to, to see you again, my mate. Yeah. Um, how's life? Brilliant, to be honest with you. You know, there's a bit of sun in Manchester here for a change, which you don't get too often. So that obviously puts you in a good mood. But uh, no, I've been, been um, really, really busy now. I mean, I think, you know, I think I speak for everyone. In lockdown's been a terrible time and a frustrating time for <coughs> for all of us. But um, I've just kept in the gym, training the, you know, the small group of lads that, uh, that I do. A few of them's had... Um, Few of us had a few fights, which has been uh, which has been good. But they've all improved during lockdown. Campbell's turned professional now. He's had two fights again, and he fights again uh, on the 31st of July. So um, uh, everything's everything's really good. Couldn't be couldn't be better really. And it's nice to see that we're we're coming to the end of it all now. I think hopefully you know. From a non-boxing perspective, are you bulletproof after everything that you've been through now? Absolutely. I don't think I've ever been as happy as what I am at the minute and um, and that is no you know you know I don't do I don't do um, bullshit do what I mean uh, obviously life was was a lot of fun when it was this 40,000 thing and there's only one Ricky Hatton and I was holding world championship belts above me and obviously those times were the, were the greatest but I think as far as you know for so many times for so many years you know like the Mayweather fight the Pacquiao fight I really struggled with and retirement I struggled to come to terms with and I had all me all my problems to see, you know, I feel, feel blessed every day that I didn't take my own life a few years ago, you know, otherwise I wouldn't have made up with my mum and dad, I wouldn't have made up with Billy Graham, I wouldn't have seen my two, my two million fern, you know, grow up to the to the, to the the girls they're turning into, I wouldn't have seen Campbell turn pro, I wouldn't have seen Lila, my granddaughter, my granddad, granddad I Hitman can't now. I so. can't believe we're the same age <laughs> and you're, you're granddad, yeah. I hope so, I'm a few uh, years behind you in that respect. So, you know, it, it doesn't need me to tell you what, 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 what you think, you know, I could have lost out on so many things if I'd have gone down that road and thankfully I did and then that's why... I try and bang the drum, you know, for the for the mental health thing. As much as much as I see my job as a, a boxing trainer now and a dad, I see myself as an ambassador for mental health because I I, I could have missed out on so much, Tris. <clears throat> there's so much. There's 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 so much that you've said there, which I'd like to talk about. But obviously, you talk about being an ambassador for mental health. Boxing's leading the way in some respects now. When you think of what you've been through and talked about, Tyson Fury. Frank Bruno and so forth. Yeah. Boxing's pulling its pulling its weight, isn't it? Well, I think um, not that you know everyone who does anything for mental health, they all deserve a pat on the back and they all do that. But I think people that have the mental health are finding it a little bit of a shocker when you know you know when world champion boxers are coming forward and saying you know hey I've got it, I cry, I've been I was crying every day. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes I wake up and I just think what am I doing here and that you know when you've got people like myself who won the world title and Tyson Fury and Frank Bruno former heavyweight champions of the world and they're turning around and you know telling about the stories of how they you know didn't want to get out of bed in the morning you know just kept you know just kept coming home whenever we had an hour to ourselves we'd be crying buckets and they think what you, you know you're Frank Bruno you're you're Tyson Fury you're Ricky Hatton but I mean I think and I think that's why you know boxing probably has a, a I won't say a bigger impact because that's been disrespectful to, to anyone else who who tries helping. But I think it I think it hit it's home a bit harder. I think. How often do you stop to think about those amazing nights, particularly say Costa Zoo or Las Vegas? Do you actually stop and maybe allocate say five minutes to go down memory lane, or does it just on the treadmill of life you just don't? No, I don't. Anymore? I don't think about them anymore. I don't watch about them anymore. But you know. When a few years ago, when people used to say to me, oh, Ricky, I had the best time in my life, you know, when I went to Las Vegas for the Mayweather fight. Oh, my God, I know it. And, you know, it was absolutely brilliant. I think, well, I'm glad you enjoyed yourself because I got, I got, I got battered. <laughs> well, Matthew, no, said, <laughs> Matthew said the same thing. He said, oh, I love Las Vegas. I yeah, was like, oh. yeah, but no, it, it, it's very true. And for years ago, because I, I, I was devastated about the Mayweather defeat, you know what I mean, and, uh, and the Pacquiao defeat for that matter. And years ago, when anyone used to mention it, he used to send me under. Yeah, used to yeah. send me under and people doesn't matter how many people say well it was Mayweather it was Pacquiao Rip you two of the greatest of all time what have you got to worry about that didn't matter to me you know what I mean and it's brilliant now when people will say oh what a night one of Manchester's best night the Costa Zoo fight I went over to had some of the best times in my life going to Vegas watching you you know where it used to used to put my head away now I, I, I enjoy talking to it about it where a few years ago when people mentioned up I used to think oh not that again but yeah when was the last time you watched either one of your fights or a 24-7, anything like that? Um, <clears throat> I've watched it, I think I did a, 
think I did a, a podcast, I think. I think it might have been with Gareth Davis. I did a bit of a, a thing on the... Um, Oh, well, that, 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 I mean, I meant for pleasure, not in terms oh, of... Oh, for pleasure? Uh, no, every now and again it will pop up on, you know, one of... You, know, one you of haven't the, gone out of your way and no, said, oh, that's... No, 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 but I, I do enjoy, you know, people talking about it and, and more youngsters asking me questions, you know, like, oh, how did you feel with this and how do you feel with that? You know, it was... Uh, it's something that, you know, it's... Yeah, even though it was a bit of pill to swallow at the time, some of the greatest times of, of, of my life and to, to be here now to talk about it is because I nearly wasn't, yeah. Did that last fight with Sinchenko give you the answers you needed for the next stage of your life? Absolutely. I think... Um, sorry, can you just hold that mic? Sorry, sorry. That's right. I think I was in... Um, I think I'm in a better... I was in a, I'd, I'd got over all my, my problems and that was the reason for making the comeback because I was in a good frame of mind, I was in a good place, I got myself healthy and fit and I thought to myself, I feel like with the stories that were in the paper and stuff like that, I feel like I'd let people down and I thought that people thought that maybe I was a bit of a fraud. Do you know what I mean? As, you know, the, the, the kid next door type and then all of a sudden I'm seeing doing what I'm doing. But the only thing I can ask, I asked for people and can still ask was for a bit of bit of sympathy because I was a very very poorly man I didn't know where I was what I was doing I was with it was a really really um, tough time so I even though a lot of people thought I didn't need to make it I felt I needed to make it and I picked probably a tougher opponent than maybe I should have done maybe I should have had a little warm-up fight then gone for someone like a Senchenko but you know in typical Ricky Atten fashion no if I can't beat him I might as well if I can't beat him I can't I might as well wrap it in and and that's what I did, and I got the answers because, you know, you always think you've got one more fight in you. And, you know, it was clear after a couple of rounds, Rick, it's not there no more. It's gone. But Did you feel that then? Did you feel different in there? Yeah, after like... two rounds, I just I just knew just, you know, not quite getting out of the way enough. Just me, the bite in me punches, just not quite the sting in them and, you know, landing correctly and everything like that. But, I mean, I think I was... Um, I think it was winning. Maybe I'd be nose in front ever so slightly, but he was starting to come, come, come back at me. But um, even then, Tris, um, if you if you remember the fight, it was everything was rushed. I was always an undermile in our fighter, but everything was rushed. Everything was hurried because even though I was in a good place um, for the Senchenko fight and it had got my life back together a little bit, I still hadn't made up with Billy Graham and I still hadn't made up with my mum and dad, which was the which was. They always got to be the two main things because I love Billy Graham and if I can't share it with Billy Graham who was there from day one and I can't share it with my mum and dad who my mum and dad and every time I come back to the corner every round I just looked at ringside and I, I, I couldn't see my mum and dad where my mum and dad used to as, as you remember always sat at them seats at the front mm. and every time the, every round and then when the fight started drifting away from me I kept looking down at the seats where my mum and dad used to be and they, they weren't there because I hadn't made up with them. And that's why I think as the fight went on and then I started losing around here and there, panic, a little bit of panic had set in. And I think, I think if I'd have just got me at my nose over the finishing line, you know what I mean? Because I think I was just about winning. But I think everything was worried. I think I'd make a better comeback now than I would do even back then, even though I'm you know, probably five years on. That was... Um, that was it. I saw it like made me come back, and even though I was in a good place, the main things in my life I still hadn't put right. Sure. Which was Billy Graham and my mum and dad, and with every round, Bob Shannon was talking to me, and Bob did a great job in my training camp, but nothing was sinking in. All I was doing was looking down, thinking, "Where's my mum and dad? Where's my mum and dad?" And I think it showed in my performance because if you look, remember back at the fight, everything was a little bit under a mile an hour, even for Ricky Hatton, and I think that was the. The thing, when I look back now, I think if the Ricky Hatton of today, back then, you know... It was, if you're it, in that same frame of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I, think I'd, I think I'd have walked it, yeah. So back then as well, there was talk of this comeback leading to fights with people like Amir Khan and Kel Brook. Were they serious? Were they fights that you wanted? No, I don't then? think so. I think people mentioned it and talked to it. But, I mean, I was, you know, Amir Khan's a friend and Kel Brook's a, a, a friend. But, I mean... I mean, friends fight each other, don't they, in, in boxing? But I was just coming to, um, I was just coming to an end. I was thinking to myself, if I, if I could beat Senchenko, um, uh, Malinaji was the the world champion at the time, and I thought to myself, if I could, if I could beat Senchenko, because I mean, I didn't want to have fight after fight after fight after fight. I just wanted to get, I just wanted to get my reputation back and clear, you know, and, and, and sort of like make people proud again which is what I did, because even though I got beat, people say, well, fair play to Ricky, he's had all these problems, but, you know, like we've all had, yeah. 
But look what he did to, to come back. And I was thinking to myself, if I can just beat Senchenko, then I'd get ranked to number one contender. And then the champion would be Pauli Malinaji. And I'd already beat Pauli. And I had no disrespect to Pauli, because I love Pauli to bits. I think he'd have been an easier fight than Senchenko, because he didn't carry the firepower. Sure. I think I'd have, if I'd have beat Senchenko, just got me over that finish line, my confidence would have gone up. Then I'd have, I'd have shaked off the ring rust. And then I'd have gone into Malinaji, who's a better boxer than Senchenko, but you know you need a bit of firepower to keep me off you. And Malinaji didn't have that, did he? So I think that was my thinking behind it. And I wasn't really thinking I'm here or or Kel Brook. I mean, the, probably the good thing is is that Kel Senchenko did beat me, and he didn't beat Malinaji because then I'd have probably had another and another and another and another. And yeah. that's not really what to do because I knew I was past it. Yeah. Um, was Oscar? De La Hoya ever in play in your career for a fight? He was, yeah. He was in play for... Um, if I had beat Pacquiao, needless to say, you know, I'd have thought we'd... You know, I'd, uh, we were talking about boxing um, De La Hoya. And that was the only time it's uh, ever, been, ever, been, ever been mentioned, to be honest, which that would have been fantastic. We Possibly was, at Wembley. Yeah, it? we're talking Wembley. We'd have had, you know, under, you know oh, I think it would have broke all records, you know, me and, uh, me and Oscar. But, you know, it wasn't meant to... To be the, the Pacquiao fight was devastating, and I think the the performance. There was a few things behind the scenes that were going wrong. I think I overtrained a little bit, you know what I mean, and uh, I, I didn't do any southpaw pads leading up to fight, which was a, a bit of a disappointment. But I mean, I think it was clear to see that my better days were be were behind me. Well, you know what Pacquiao did to me, he was doing to everyone. To be fair, so I mean, I'm not going to lay too many excuses at uh, at that, but um, that would have uh, it's a shame, really. Because I think before he landed the left hook, I think it was just starting to turn the, the fight around, really. I mean, it was only round two. <laughs> you know, so that sounds a bit... Time. That, yeah, that, time. Yeah, that, <laughs> sound, that sounds a bit shit, personally. I retract that. But, but no, I think um, I'd sort of like, you know, I'd gone through the pain barrier a little bit and I'd got, let them, got through them two knockdowns and I just started to turn it a little bit. And then I think two seconds before the end, if I could have, maybe if I could have just got my ass on that stool at the end of the second, you know, well, probably not, but the um, um Still, not bad for someone who wasn't the best carpet fitter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, <laughs> I was doing more damage to myself carpet fitting than I did in <laughs> boxing, to be honest with you. I've still got all my fingers, I'll never know. But no, um, at, at the end of the day, you know, um, I was a council estate lad, you know what I mean? And I just started boxing, going to my local gym like every everyone does. And Well, you, you say that, what, what triggered it? Because you were the first, obviously, Matthew fo followed you and you... You've done some kickboxing, haven't you? But why go to kickboxing and boxing? Well, I did kickboxing first because I was into the Bruce Lee films as a, as a little and I used to, I used to love Bruce Lee. And then I thought, oh, I want to go, Mum, Dad, I want to go to the boxing gym. I want to go do some kickboxing. So I went to the uh, the kickboxing gym and obviously I've always been a little short ass. So, you know, my me, me legs weren't, you know, so I was, I was getting my head kicked in basically. So, but I could, they could see I had a talent with my hands. So they advised me, they said, listen, Ricky, you know, maybe kickboxing is not for you but why don't you give boxing a try and I went and it just basically um, went from there but it's you know the, from the, the kid from the council estate just starting off kickboxing and going to boxing and I, I remember it like it is yesterday the schoolboy finals boys club finals junior ABA finals golden gloves ABAs and it's you know you never you know you never, never, never thought it would turn out the way it was and, and I think people when I first went pro People were talking about me as probably, you know, one of the best prospects in the country. But I think my defence was a little bit on the leaky side, you know, and I used to get cut, you know, every every five minutes. And me and Billy Graham used to say, we're going to beat the best, we're going to beat the best in the weight division. And I think um, everyone used to thought we were talking through our asses, to be honest with you. But, I mean, that's what I did in the end. And, um, and then to go on two weights and Pacquiao and Mayweather fights and 40,000 to going in front of me to Vegas and filling out the Etihad Stadium and stuff like that. It's, it's a lot of bucket list oh, things to take to that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, you know, I'll never ever wake up from the dream. And even though I went through hard times now, you know, that, that's where I am today. I look back at everything now and look, look back with pride. Tell me about sparring Pat Barrett. Pat Barrett, yeah. Well, Pat was uh, great friends with, with Pat. Uh, always, always, always has been. To be, be fair, and I used to go down with um, uh, my 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 amateur trainer, uh, late Mr. Paul Dunn, and um, 
he used to take me into the Collier's the Moston gym, he used to take me into the Phoenix Cam gym and sparring. I was learning, I was like 16 years of age, and I sparred with um, Pat one day. And um, neither is that Pat had to open up on me because even though I was 16, I was pretty good, but, but you know. I think Pat must have got, I, I, I caught Pat with a few. He used to, he must have thought, don't take the piss, Ricky. <laughs> you know, don't take the mickey. Um, and uh, then he opened up and just hit me with a, with a body shot. And I'd never, ever felt pain like it. I mean, I was a body puncher anyway in the amateurs. But, um, and he just, Pat just told me, he said, listen, you know, calm down. You can't bowl over everyone and you can't walk in this gym and bowl over everyone. And it just, I mean, I was never... An arrogant kid. I was just, I was just very good for my age. And when I used to spar with Pat and Robin Reed and Delroy Wall, the, you know, they had, to, they had to open up on me because I was aggressive, and I was talented for young, for sixteen. But they taught me, uh, they taught me in that gym, that Collier's gym, a very, you know, a very important lesson. And to be honest, some of the things what Brian Hughes did and what Pat Barrett does now with his kids that are coming through, like Lyndon Arthur and Zelfa Barrett and stuff like that. The, the tradition is the, the the training and the tradition in the Colliers gym has never trained, and I still, um, even though I went with with Billy Graham, I still use some of the stuff what Pat Barrett and um, and in particular Brian Hughes taught me back in them early days, and Pat taught me a, a very very important lesson. I don't know if Pat remembers this. He even come down to me me carpet shop one day when I was working in the carpet shop with my dad, and he just turned around and said, you know, I think it was this. Uh, sorry about that, Rick, but you've got to learn. You know, I mean, you can't roll over everyone. You need to. You know, tweak fit your style a few things, be a little bit more subtle in the approach, and you know that was just as you know as a 16 year old. I mean, and, and I never, no matter how, how many belts are in that trophy cabinet, I never forget things what people have done for me you know, like that. And I, you know, if I think hard enough, there's umpteen people that have helped me in areas such as that as a young kid coming through, and it stuff like that. You know, helped me get to where I got. At what point did you fight Jamie Moore? I boxed Jamie Moore, um, I think it was in the schoolboy championships at, um, I think it was 14 or 15, 14 or 15 years of age, and it was in Blackpool. And I'd won a couple of national titles um, by then. And um, so normally when you win a couple of national titles, you think to yourself, you know, in the East Lanx Cheshire area, which is just your, your area, you know, your round, which it was at the time. You, I thought I'm going to get, a, I'm going to get a buy it. I'm going to get a walkover. No one in in Manchester or or, or you know or Cheshire's going to going to going to fight me here. And um, Mr. Dunn said to me, he said, you you fighting, you fighting someone called uh, Jamie Moore from Little Holton Amateur Boxing Club. So I thought, oh right, well right, you know, I've been always, and he'd only had about nine fights. So I thought. Oh, right, fair play. So anyway, you know, get in there for the fight with Jamie. And he dressed, he dressed like like me. You know, when Mike Tyson was all, was at the at the, the hot top of his game, black leather boots, black shorts, black vest, and he had the same as me. And we'd never seen him box before, but looking at the way he dressed, I thought he's he fights like me. This this fellow and uh, come out the first round, a few. You know, a few feeling shots, something like that, and I threw a left up, and I, he rolled under, and I missed him by a mile. So I thought, well, for nine fights, that's not bad. I've got a tough night coming on here, and uh, I just got him on the ropes. I think it was a double left hook. I think I sent over a double left hook, and he, you know, over his southpaw lead, and he, he went down. And then I got up. I think I gave him another standing count, and then another standing count in the corner. Um, um, chucked the towel in, but I remember saying to him, we had a good chat after with his family. Uh, my family were in the in the bar after and that and and I said uh, I'd be honest, Jamie. I said I didn't think I was going to get a fight in the first round there, but to, you know to fight me in the nine rounds and don't be don't be um, don't don't let it get you down, you know, because it was a first round defeat. I said what you did in that first round defeat, you know, I mean it, it was it was like nip and tuck until I copped him, yeah. and then when I copped him, that 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 was was that. But I mean for nine fights, what he did in them opening minutes, I said stay at it. And what he did in his career, probably the, one of the best British fighters we've ever had to not win a world title. To be honest, always in exciting fights, and I'm very very proud of that to say that he's my mate. That was 13, 13, when we were 13 years of age, and he's still my mate to this day, and I'm very close to the, uh, to the family, love them, love them all to bits. Your first pro fight was on a Robin Reed villain witness. I think you fought Haseen Sharifi. What was the realistic goal? Everyone says it's to be a world champion, but realistically, were you thinking, I'm going to be a world champion? I, I was, believe it or not, and I think that's the way you've got to be, no, no matter how young you are, or you know, you know, how inexperienced you are like that. If you've got a goal for, say, well, 
if I won a British title, you know, I think I'd be doing all right. That's not the attitude to have. I mean, winning a British title is a fantastic achievement. You know what I mean? It was my great one. I, I, I wanted that British title before anything, before the turn pro. But I think you've got to reach for the, for the stars. And I was sparring in a gym at the time with pe fighters like Paul Burke and uh, Andy Holligan, Steve the Viking Foster, Hensley Bingham, and even um, rookie professionals who were just turned pro, like Mark Haslam and Chris Barnett and Nicky Boyd and like that, you know. And when I was training alongside Cal Thompson, Maurice Corr, and, and just, just, just to name name a few of them, they were saying, "Listen, Ricky, you keep at this game. You keep at this game. Dedicate yourself. Listen to Billy. Keep working. You're going to be a world champion." And I thought to myself, listen, Cal Thompson's the world champion, you know. He's telling me I'm going to be a world champion. And I thought, and that's just, it just sort of like, I knew it was all right when I was winning schoolboy and boys clubs and junior ABAs and boxing for England as an amateur. But when the current professional champions tell you that you're going to be a world champion, uh, there was nothing in my mind. And I sort of like gave me the confidence to say, listen, you've got half a chance here. If these are saying it, they know what they're on about. So, I mean... You know, did I believe it would go several times over? And you know, but I mean, they made me believe it was, it was still going to be a bit a big ask, wasn't it? But it made me believe. It made me give me the confidence that I thought, yeah, and that's the attitude I've got to have. And I think that's the attitude everyone's got to have. Did you close the show at Witness? And am I right in thinking it was all delayed? Because close the show. I think it was closed because <laughs> I should I should have been a floater at half past seven, where they wait they wait for one of the the um, the main fights to have a, a stoppage. And then they'll fill you in on the t you know, to get you on the TV and everything like that. And every uh, fight went the distance. And he had my gloves on, off. Well, you're not on, Rick. You're, no, you know, you know, you're on in an hour. No, take your gloves off, Rick. You're on in another hour. Um, and I think I should have been on at half seven. And I think on at half 12 at night, to be honest with you. They were, they were, they were, it was the last fight. And I was in the ring, actually, because Robin Reed got taken to hospital with dehydration after he fought Asin Sharifi. So, um, St. John's Ambulance or whatever it is had to be at ringside keeping an eye on Robin first and before they could come they, we, had, we needed them to come back to ringside before we could Sorry. carry on with the, with, with the fight so uh, I was in the ring about 20 minutes 25 minutes before the, even the, the first the first bell went it was uh, and it was incredible not many fans left for that no, no fans left, just my mum and dad. <laughs> and to be honest with you, they were, they were cleaning up. They were picking, they were collecting the chairs up and stacking the chairs up and sweeping up and everything like that. And it was only a few close friends and immediate family that that was there. But I mean, I have one of the posters in the gym. I'm not even on the poster. <laughs> I'm not even on that. So long ago when it was, no one had heard of me. But uh, but no, it's um, wonderful, wonderful times. That's and I'm, I'm very fortunate that even I'm. 42 now I can remember fights such as that from me from me amateurs even remember you know Kid McCauley I remember he threw him up and he went over to the corner stuck his head through the ropes and spewed up in the book yeah, the thing. then he spewed up all of remember Nobby Nobbs used to have the trainer yeah, I used yeah. to have all the journeymen at the time but uh, brilliant 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 times your second fight was on the Naz Kelly bill what was it like being on that show in New York <clears throat> yeah it was incredible I mean um, I was very I was blessed because Naz was the biggest uh, name in British boxing at the time, you know what I mean? And Naz was absolutely flying, and I got, I was so fortunate to fight on so many of his um, undercards. And even from a young age, I was always a bit of a boxing historian, you know what I mean? I used to collect all the books, uh, the, the videos, and see all the fighters of old, you know, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard, Mamad Ali, Joaquin Marsh, you know, all of them. And I used to watch them, and I used to all see them at Madison Square. I knew, even at 18 years of age, I knew exactly what Madison Square Garden was. And uh, to do it in the 18 fight, you know, talk about character building. And especially, um, I went without Billy Graham, because Billy Graham was... Oh, no, hang on, so we're going ahead to Detroit there. So No, no. Second fight, Madison Square Garden. Yeah. And 18th fight was Detroit, wasn't it? No, 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 no. I was 18 years of age. Oh, okay, sorry. I was 18 years sorry. of age. And on the second fight, on the, the same night as yeah. it should have been in Madison Square Garden, I think Ensley Bingham was fighting... On the the UK card, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Was that yeah. Ensley Bingham or Paul Burke? I can't remember. And Billy it. stayed behind. Yeah, Billy had to stay behind because obviously, you know, Ensley was in a title fight, and I was only 18 years of age. So the late Nobby Nobbs, who was Frank Warren's matchmaker at the time, he went in my corner, and I went with Danny Williams. And Danny Williams, I think, was trained by Jim McDonnell, and I think he had someone on the English show together. So me and Danny had to go on our own. You know what I mean? To rookie pros and you know without our without our trainers and we trained together all week and i think as 
me and Danny both won. And, um, yeah, brilliant times. You know, you're Michael Buffer, the ring announcer, and George Foreman sat there at ringside, you know, working for HBO. And, you know, I'm I'm just, like, 18 years of age. Just, I mean, I mean, no one could comprehend that what, that I was going to go on and win the world title was like I did. But that's still one of my, the highlights. Where were you for Naz <laughs> Kelly? Were you right there? Yeah, sat at ringside, yeah, watching it. it was, and it was like, there was like, because um, it was massive when Naz went to, to New York, when it, it was everywhere, Tris. And it was like Robert De Niro, Al Pacino and people like that at ringside, you know, and I was <laughs> just sat there with me, me kickers on and me, and me jeans, you know what I mean? It was like, whoa, um, 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 unbelievable. And boxing, you know, when I, when I talk about things like that, you, you can't, um, can't put a price on memories like that you also can't put a price on the education that you had because obviously you talked about the sparring you had but even the way that you were moved like you were fighting every month every couple of months you were fighting hard men journeymen you were fighting guys like Mark Ramsey Paul Denton good hard experienced fighters yeah so like your education and the way that you were moved was textbook really wasn't it I think Frank Warren you couldn't have had anyone bring bring you through more correctly than the way Frank Warren bring me on he had me on at you know, your small hall shows, and if you like, you know, the Kingsway Leisure Centre for my debut in Everton Park, Liverpool, and, you know, and, you know, you know, Altrincham, I was fighting the Leisure Centres in Altrincham, and then all of a sudden, you know, just to give you a little taster, you know, you know, Madison Square Garden, and then, you know, you'd, you'd fight the normal shows, like the Grafton in Liverpool, and then you'd fight at... Um, um, uh, Atlantic City, you know what I mean. So if he, he was he was building me up, he, you know this is where this is where if you're going to get here in a few years' time, top of the bill, world title fights, he put me on the undercard, and that was part of my education, you know, to see this is this is how if you get there, Ricky, this is how it's going to work. Do you know what I mean? This is what it's going to be like, and I think my education he kept me busy, he kept me fighting. He yeah, got me a couple of intercontinental titles, which were won the WBO, WBA, and we fought all different foreign opposition, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and, and it was... And by the time... I think even, if you remember, Tris, the WBU title that he got me, which wasn't a recognised... It was a world title, but not as recognised it was. I think when I was defending that WBU title, which ultimately got me my shot at Costa Zoo, but if you look at some of the people that I fought, Tony Pepper at first and the likes of John Bailey, but then Freddie Pendleton, who was, you know, yeah. a little bit past it, but I mean, for, for a youngster going up, and then the Ben Takis, the Vince Phillips, the Ray Oliveiras and that, you know, good level, oh, fighters, good level yeah. fighters, you know, where building your confidence up, a little bit of a, a test each time, it was, it was, no, he couldn't have brought me on any better, Frank. The Manchester scene was really buzzing as well. How did one city get that lightning in a bottle at that time with you, Farnell, Gomez, uh, your brother, Macklin, Jamie? Like, how did that happen? Were you all inspired by Champs Camp? Do you think yeah. it all came from that? I think era? it all inspired from Champs Camp and um, we had Pat Barrett. You had, well, you, had, you had the Kyle Thompson, was the world cruiserweight champion. Steve Van Viking Foster fought, you know, Winky Wright, you know, for the world titles, just like Ensley Bingen did. You know, Ensley Bingham was a Lonsdale belt winner out, outright. Um, then you had, you know, you Frank know, from, Brown, from the Morris yeah, Gore. Frank Hart, Morris Gore, Robin Reed. I know he was from Runcorn, but he fought out the Collierhurst gym. And Manchester was a real hotbed. And then there was myself, Michael Gomez, Jamie Moore, Mike Brody come through. And then, you know, in the last recent years, Telly Flanagan, Anthony Crawler, you know, just just to name, you know, a couple, and it just all seemed, Manchester's always been a, you know, a real fighting city, because we've, we've always had tradition. The 2000s were magical, though, weren't they? Oasis, you know, Britain Well, Park, I mean, whole, it, it, was like, it was like the, um, it was like the centre of the universe, wasn't it? You know, you, you had your Stone Roses, you had Oasis, you know, and Happy Mondays, you know, boxing, Manchester United. Man Manchester United. I knew you'd mention that, you dickhead. <laughs> but no, Manchester United were winning everything. But you know, still Manchester. You know, we had the best music, the best football teams, the best bo best best boxing, if you like. I mean, what a you know what a time to be a Mancunian growing up in them times. And we've always, you know, now football is strong as ever because City. I win here, I win in, I win in stuff. Uh, yeah. and, the, and the boxing scenes still buzzing, you know, and the man, you know, the professional in the Manchester area, do you know what I mean? It, it's, um, and 
we're always I've always been proud of me, me Manchester roots. But yeah, I think that's what it is. If amateurs see people like myself, you know, winning world titles and that, more kids want to go in the gym, don't they? And, you know, in the amateur gyms, and it all just small balls. And we've had some great fighters over the years. Great fighters. You won your first title against Tommy Peacock, the central area, and then you and Billy, you guys went out on the piss in Germany on a on a after you'd fought on the undercard of Mikkel Chesky and Mark Prince. Is that right? Yeah. Well, we always um, we always needed um, paying on the night or giving a few quid on the night because um, I was I was on decent money and I was fighting dead regular. But I mean, for me sins, I used to piss it all up. You know, you used to lend it me mates. Let's well, you go out. Were you living like that, paycheck to paycheck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pay, and, and and I shouldn't have been because I was fighting regular and I was on good money. But you know, I was I'd, I'd, we'd go out and I'd say, "Oh, we're going out with my mates." I go, oh, "There, there's hundred quid for you. There's hundred quid for you." And I mean, you. And then before you know it, my money had gone. So when am I fighting there? I'd be on the Frank, Frank, when am I out next? When am I fighting next? Um, and I used they had to give us some money up front. So we boxed in Germany and um, we we went out. We stayed in a hotel and there was a nightclub. And in the nightclub downstairs, they had where you could you could order your drinks. They'd write it down on a piece of paper and put it on the top shelf. So then they'd, they'd make a, you know, a, a list of it and you pay when you check out. So me and Billy, you know, after the fight, went in the nightclub, you know, went in the nightclub, paid for this, paid for that. During the week, you know, I'd be having a, I'd be having a coffee, you know, the week during the fight, Billy would be having a couple of pints, signed, put it on the top shelf. <laughs> and by the time the night after the fight, by the time we uh, went to check out in the morning, and we had another day to go. We had the Sunday, we were flying home on the Monday. So we got down at reception and we just, we just checked what our bill is and I think it was something like, you know, I think 700 quid between the two of us. We was having cocktails and buying champagne for people and everything like that. So I went, Billy, you went, 600 quid, 700 quid between the two of us. He went, how much have you got? I went, 120. Billy went, how much have you got? <laughs> Billy, how much have you got? I've got 150. Oh, how are we going to pay this? Frank, Frank, I, Frank, Frank. Mr. Warren, no, Mr. Warren's checked out the hotel. Mr. Ailing's already checked out the hotel. They went home yesterday, so I went, oh, right. Well, I thought, <laughs> they've all checked out, so we can't get no money. What are we going to do? So Billy Gray and phone in the morning says, meet me at the bottom of the lift with your suitcase. Meet me at the bottom of the lift. <laughs> Got up in the morning, pissed, <laughs> we drove drunk, <laughs> go out the lift, stuck my head out the window. The fellow behind reception, they must have thought, these two can't pay this bill. These looking out the window, out the fa- out the, the lift like that, the doors open. I went, oh, he's, lo- he's looking straight at us, Bill, looking straight at us, Bill. So we're going to have to make a run for it. The taxi's outside the front door, going to have to make a run for it. Go! So we ran out of the lift, jumped in the taxi, <laughs> went to the airport, 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 airport. And we kept getting bills for like, um, for like, you know, 18 months. Bill from the, from the hotel, Marriott Hotel, Marriott Hotel. Kept chucking it in the bin, chucking it in the bin, and again, eventually it must have disappeared. But uh, I think Frank must have, Frank Warren must have paid that off for us in the end. Of, well, but, but me and Billy, um, oh, we had such great times, even in the, the the younger days. Just we were just council estate lads, done well, pots for rags. <laughs> I mentioned obviously that. Fi- I mentioned that fight in uh, Detroit. Um, Gilbert Kiros, I think, and you were cutting that fight. But also, what I wanted to speak to you about was you went to the Kronk, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was your first experience of the Kronk. Was the first experience of the Kronk? I mean, I, I mean, like I said earlier, I've always been a boxing historian, aren't I? You know, so I knew all the old fighters, all the old trainers, and the Kronk gym is a, is a you know, it, it's boxing, boxing tradition, royalty, isn't it? You know, the Kronk gym. And we went down there, and I was just surprised at how just small it was. It was just like one big ring in the in the you know one big ring in this room, a couple of bags on the outside, and all they used to do was just spar. It was unbelievable. It was like small ceiling, sweltering heat. I was you know, Mick, Mick Williamson come to watch me um, come and watch me me train, and Mick Williamson was like, oh, I've got to get out of here. His shirt was absolutely dripping, but the. Um, they said to me, and I was like, it was, it was like traditionally, you know, a, a, you know, a gym that was full of black gentlemen, you know what I mean? So I was like, you know, <laughs> you know, like the milky bar kid, you know, pay, pale white as white can be, you know, I had a little basin cut haircut like that. And as I'm on the, the bag, I'm going, because ah, ah, when I used to punch, I used to grunt ah, sure. with every shot. And then everyone on the, all the, everyone in the gym on the bags were going, ah, 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 ah. Huh, huh, taking the mickey out of me because I was only like 20, 22 
you know, like a milk bottle, you know, shit haircut, you know, so. <laughs> Uh, and then Billy got on the pads, he got the body belt on, so as I went on the pads, I went bang, 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 changing the angles, doing what I did, stepping around, pushing Billy on the ropes, moving in on him, and uh, and next minute they all come off the bag and started standing round the ring and leaning over the um, leaning over the ropes, and Billy would go again, come on Rick, quick burst, come on, move round quicker, change the angle, finish on the jab when you've finished, move your head, and Billy would be throwing the shots at me as well and everything, and... Um, by the time I finished, I took my bandage off and sat on the ring and they all come round and they all come round and went, you know, how you doing, Ricky? He said, Ricky, in it, yeah, yeah. How many fights have you had? I think it was like 16 or 18 unbeaten or something like that. They all went, oh, respect, good, good, good luck on, good luck on Saturday night. So, so get like, I mean, imagine for me walking, you just imagine me walking in the <laughs> this little, little, yeah, little yeah. youngster, you know, white as white Did you can feel be. intimidated? Um, I did a little bit, but then I went. I, tim I went for intimidated. So when they were taking the mickey out of me, intimidated, pissed off, and then Been when I got where, yeah, then when I thought, I'll show you, get that body belt out, Billy. Let's have a blast here. And they got the body belt out, and when they all come round and that, they so I mean, for a youngster at that age to look at this little kid here, oh look at him, oh bless him, you know type thing, and then for them all the fighters, we're talking professional fighters, you know, and, and at what level. I don't think it really matters, but it was all hard the, all the yeah, yeah, hard and pros, all the crunk fighters to come round, lean over there and go, how many fights have you had? Oh, uh, 16, 17, wow, good luck, mate, good luck to you. And for that, to walk in the crunk gym and have that reaction, brilliant, you know, yeah. When you fought Lowry at Bethnal Green, uh, your brother Matthew made his debut. How far did you think Matthew was going to go? Uh, I think we had... Um, we kept an open mind with Matthew when he went pro because he, he as an amateur, he, he started, then he packed in, and he started, and then he packed in, and then he won um, like a novice senior ABA title, which obviously is, 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 a, is a good achievement, bearing in mind how many fights he'd had and any experience he had. And Matthew said to, to myself and my dad one day, he said, Listen, he said, you know, I said, I'm on my hands and knees, you know, fitting carpets every day, you know, for, you know, for the, for the pittance. He says, You know, where uh, you're going in the gym, Rick, you know, you're, as hard as boxing is, you're going in the gym, chucking your bag in your boot, driving to the gym and doing something you love and getting paid for it. He said, Matthew, Matthew said to me, I said, I'd rather, I'd rather be doing that, you know, and I'd rather give it a go because he was still fighting amateur. He thought, I'd rather go pro and give it a go and, and I, think, I think we kept an open mind and I think Matthew himself kept an open mind and um, you know he had a few you know speed bumps over the way he lost a couple of six rounders he got disqualified I think in, in one of his fights but he he stayed at it and stayed at it and stayed at it and he ended up um, winning the European title which I think he made three defences so that earned him a shot at Sol Alvarez for the world title and he went the distance with um Sol Alvarez. So I think the, the moral to the story is, uh, you know, Matthew never won a world title, but, you know, for somebody, you know, to, to you know, go professional and say, I'll give it a go, <laughs> you know what I mean? And to, to win a European title, defend it three times, go the distance with Sol Alvarez, you know what I mean? That just is a, a perfect example of if you, if you, if you did, if you, if you, Take your defeats on the on the chin. Still stay at it. Still work hard. Still work hard. Still believe in yourself. Look what you you know. Look what you you, you can do. So I think you know. I mean, everyone knew that I could sort of like. But I think Matthew, in many respects, is every every bit as as, as success as me because he he you know everyone knew that I had half a chance of doing it. You know of doing well. And Matthew went and just give it a go. And look what he did. And look what you can get if you just work hard, dedicate yourself, listen to your trainers, and and don't let a couple of defeats along the way get you down. Just stay at it and stay, you know, stay determined. And that that's what he did. You had a few interesting fights by this point, but your first classic came next, and that was John Thaxton. Um, one of the hardest fights you had. Uh, yeah, one of the hardest fights, and still a lot of people say to me that was one of one of their favourite fights that I was uh, yeah, I was involved in. You know, one from could, a could have been stopped. Yeah, one from a drama point of view. You know what I mean? They had a really really bad cut, and it was bleeding. Um, you know, like 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 crazy in the opening round. But I had a, I had an exceptional cutsman in Mick the Rub, Mick, Mick Williamson um, in my corner, and I was fortunate, even though the cut was massive, he stopped it pretty much straight away 
I think the referee knew it was a bad cut, but if the next two, three rounds it had continued to have bled, you know, like, like a waterfall, I think, the, I think there's every chance of could have stopping it. So Mick stopped it pretty, pretty quickly, bearing in mind how severe a cut it was. Um, and then I, um, and it's, I'd had, I'd, had, I'd had plenty of cuts leading into that, so I was able to cope with it pretty, pretty good. But it's the first time I was in against um, a big puncher like John, you know, someone with a, you know, a very, very, very good chin. And I think John must have thought Christmas come early that day, you know, so he put his foot down and went for it. And um, but like I say, Mick stopped the the cut, and when when, it, when I noticed it stopped bleeding, I started to put my foot down myself. And um, John shifted a lot of lot of punches in 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 that fight. And I, I thought to myself, how is he taking these punches? But he must have, John must have sat down on the his stool at the end of each round, as hard as it was for him. I must have, you know, and Brendan Ingle, God rest his soul, was in the corner and must have turned round and he must have looked round Brendan John and must have thought, that eye's hanging off there. Come on, stick in there, stick in there and you, it could come good, this. And, it, you know, it, it, it re reopened and started bleeding a little bit, then Mick could shut it again. And, and I think the only thing that saved me, uh, without being disrespectful to John, I think the only thing that saved me from the fact being got that I was so on top and he was shifting so much punishment. I think that it might, you know, if it if it had been stopped, I I was, could have held my hands up and said, listen, you know, it's a horrendous cut, no complaints. But I think if it had been stopped, bearing in mind how much I was on top and how much punishment John was shifting, for him to stop it, I would have been a bit cheesed off. But I mean, I mean, whatever, whatever. If it had stopped it, I've had to hold my hands up and gone, fair enough. It's a shocker that cut. But also, I'd have been a little bit devastated. And I think, ultimately, he probably, at the end of it, when you see, you know, he probably did do the right, he probably was the right decision. But if they had have stopped it, I don't think I could have had any complaints, yeah. You had plastic surgery, didn't you? Yeah, I had plastic out. surgery where, yeah, they, you know, they, they, they cut my skin and folded it back and, you know, and over the eye. But they, when they did the plastic surgery, they found out that um, there was a lump in it. And um, I didn't think anything of it at the at the time. I just thought that's how the cuts must heal, you know. And um, but what it was apparently that the first time I got cut, the the doctor that must have done it, um, instead of cleaning it out thoroughly, he must have just stitched it up, and he must, he stitched a load of Vaseline up inside the cut. So which obviously consequently set, set like rock, you know, rock hard. So whenever I got just a little bit of a a, a dig on it, it would it would burst open again you know so I mean and when you think the shot that John did it with I think it was a lead right hook from myself on the southpaw stance I think you know that that did it and it wasn't a big shot a nothing shot but when I was getting shot cut in fights previous it wasn't like you know a big a maker or anything like that it was little fight shots and I was thinking to myself they were talking about your skin being like paper skin being like paper and I thought oh this is going to be a, a problem throughout my career uh, little did we know it, what it wasn't. It wasn't because my skin was like paper. It was because this yeah. stuff was stitched in between, and consequently, once once I went had the plastic surgery after the fat and fat. Once they cleaned it out proper and stitched it up again, yeah, I got cut a few times. But you'd expect that if you've got thin skin, the cuts as you went up in quality of opposition. Yeah, the, the well, cuts to be more apparent. You a bleeder after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beforehand, yeah, yeah, and that's what it, and that's what it was. And to be honest, it gave me a, a boost with my career because I, I thought to myself you know I've, I've got the chance of doing really well here but with this you know wafer thin skin you know, I might not really do it but then when they it was like it was like a blessing from heaven of oh my god it's nothing wrong with my skin <laughs> you know what, so what is it like when you're in a fight and you're pissing blood from a cut how hard is it it is very hard, but I think that it depends does on the. Does it hurt? Is the cut sore? It, does it stop your? No, I, if, if the blood gets in the eye and all the rest of it, like what? Does it, what does it do? Does it mean that you can't see? No, if, if you know, it, sometimes it depends where the blood rushes. You know, if you if you get a cut above the eye, because nine times out of ten it was just below my uh, my eyebrow there, on that way, because I have very quite high, you know high bones there. Um, so they always tend to tended to be in the in the same place, and if it needs to say if it runs in your eye, then that causes a a major problem. Um, it can be quite painful in the in the corner with the the adrenaline. It's like the one of a thousand in a thousand adrenaline, I think it is, and you put it in the in the court. But sometimes it's it's not necessarily the adrenaline. I think it's how hard the coachman presses, but he's got to press hard. 
you know, in order to get to get the 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 adrenaline in the cut to restrict the, the you know the the blood from from flowing. But Mick Williamson always said to me, you know, the, he said to me the first time. First time I was cut, don't panic, don't panic. Nothing you can do about it. It's my job from here on in. He said, one thing I will tell you is, he said, if you panic with this, you're more likely to get hit on it again. You know, you know. therefore, it's going to make it worse. So what will be, will be. Now, let me do my job. You do your job, which is just stick to your fighting. And I think that was the best advice. And it's standing me through my stead. And when I got beat by Faxton, because it was for the British title and it was a big fight, I went, Mick, 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 how bags the cut, how bags the cut? He went, what did I tell you the first time you got cut, you dickhead? He said, listen, he went, you can't, nothing you can do about this. All you can do is keep your shape, keep yourself together, and don't worry about the cut. If you worry about the cut, you're going to make more mistakes, get it on it more, the worse it's going to be. What will be, will be, Rick. Now get out there and do your job. Let me do mine. And that's what, and it, it's a, there's no better way you can describe it of when you do get caught, or any youngsters out there when they do get caught. Listen, from that point in, it's down to your corner. There's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is, is keep your shape and technically hold yourself together, you know. So if you do, you know, so it, it doesn't worsen. The more you, more, more you panic, the more you're going to get hit, and, and the less chance you've got, you know. So I think that's the best bit of advice what Mick Williamson give me and what bit of advice I can pass on to any youngsters out there that, that, that you know, have to deal with the same problem, yeah. You beat Tony Pep for the WBU and then had a run of fights where there were often three things in common. A, a noisy MEN, um, a WBU title, and Mickey Van as a referee. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Well, Mickey Van, um, always a great referee. Referees so many um, of my fights, absolutely fit, fit as a fiddle. I saw Mickey, Mickey Van a couple of years ago, at, um, and I don't think he didn't done referee no more, but he looks, it looks fit enough to still referee. But yeah, it was, uh, and that's where I, um, I, I fought some good opponents. You know, hey, Vince. Eamon McGee was one of them. Yeah, Eamon McGee, and Eamon McGee taught me a lot because I hated Eamon. Um, he was, uh, he was up in, um, he was up in Belfast slagging me off, oh, this little kid, he's not fought anyone, he's only a baby, wait while he gets in with a proper man and all that. And then I had Junior Witter up in, in Sheffield, and he was sort of like doing the same, so I used to think, oh, I'd love to kill these, uh, used to love to get in there with these pair of dickheads, but, uh, <laughs> and, but um, and then my chance came against Damon McGee, and I thought to myself, you know, because Eamon was sometimes, he looked impressive in his fights, and then sometimes he stumped the place out. But one thing, you know, he could always do was hit. Do you know what I mean? He really, really vicious, nasty, nasty puncher. And in the second round, I, I, I put, pushed him back on the, on the ropes, uh, went to throw a shot, and he caught me square with my feet together with a, with a short right hook, and I went down. And that one wasn't the problem. You know, that was a, only a bit of a flash down. He caught me square. I got up, rubbed my gloves. I thought, that's nothing, that. But because it didn't hurt me, I carried on with the same tactics. 100 mile an hour, jump on him, try and bash him. And then he slipped down back on the ropes and he threw a short right hook. And that, this one did shake me. I fell through the ropes. Started, my legs were wobbling all over the show. And I was able to, in the corner, slip and slide and drop and just get out of the way and, and su survive the moment. And Billy Graham said to me in the corner, he said, never mind getting beat, you're going to get knocked out here if you don't hold to your tactics. So what I did was just, you know, start using my jab a little bit more, stop trading with him, stop you know, in and out, use my speed, move my angles. And, and that's what I did. But he taught me a very, very valuable lesson. You know, leave your, you know, leave your, your anger at the door. You know, it's got to be game plan, cool head, which is what you do it. And now... Whenever I go to um, to Ireland and Belfast, I always hook up with Eamon and have a pint with him, and uh, and it's one it, pint, it, yeah, well, well, one pint, one pint, one, one pint, yeah. <laughs> but no, and, it, and it's the same with Junior. You know, every time I see Junior now, all I'm up at, you know, the the Winkerbank gym, and I've seen Junior a few times, and a couple of years like that, you know, he, he when he was still active fighting himself, Junior, you know, towards the the end, he come down to the gym and sparred a couple of my. Uh, my lads and everything like that. So even though, you know, that's the type of sport boxing is, even though I hated Eamon McGee and I hated Junior Witter, I think to myself now that we're, the three of us, well, I'd like to see him as pals, yeah. Um, there was an incident in your next fight that was with Stephen Smith. That was when his dad, Darcy, burst into the ring. <laughs> Loads of controversy about that. I think your brother lost a six-rounder that, that night. How much attention did you guys put on each other's fights when you had your own fights? Could you... Pay any attention to what was going on with his? 
Um, there's nothing I could do it because I mean I, I wanted Matthew to be on my shows for the ex for, for the exposure for 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 Matthew it goes without saying you know my shows were more massive at the time and everything everyone in Manchester would say they, that's the show they want to be on so yeah Matthew was always going to go on the the show but I there was there was nothing we could um, nothing we could do about that you know just to get Matthew. Did you pay much attention to his fights when you so say you were on a few fights afterwards generally. Would you watch his or would no, you? No, never, never, never watch his. You know, just I'd get there, but you know, he'd probably be on earlier on the bill. So when I get there, you know, I'd already know the results. They'd phone me up, you know, and I'd pre I mentally prepared myself, you know, for when the phone call comes and said, "Listen, you, you know, Matt's won. Oh, Bill, and if he's won, Matt's got beat. Ah, gutted, but you know, still so keep, still keep my me, me, me focus, uh, me focus on, yeah." Did Vince Phillips hit you as hard as anyone? I would say so. And he, I know Manny Pacquiao laid me out, but I think there was a lot of... Um, Fair comment. Yeah, a lot, of miles, um, a lot of miles on the clock back then. You know, I think the damage had done to my body, you know. And listen, Manny was blasting everyone out at the, you know, at the, at the time. You know, so I mean... Um, but yeah, Vince Phillips. But don't forget, when I... That was before I boxed um, Kostya Zoo, if you remember. Because, I mean, when, you know... The, the punches that cost you. When I was young, I could walk through walls. I always had a great chin, and people used to comment on how good my chin was because I used to have a bit of a ropey defence and I used to walk onto shots, but you know, they used to just bounce off me at the time. But yeah, Vince Phillips um, hit me with a right uppercut. I was knocking 10 lumps out of him, you know, and I thought, oh, I'm on the verge of stopping him here. And I just attacked a little bit sloppily, you know, just gambled, went to attack a little bit sloppily, and he went whack with a right uppercut. And um, I felt like I couldn't feel the floor in front of me. I'm like, oh, God, why was that? And I just, you know, avoided the, the moment, slip and, slip and sliding, got out of the way. And I think if it had hit me with another one, maybe five seconds after, bang, on the same spot, it might have done me, to be honest with you, yeah. It's the hardest I'd ever, ever been in. Eamon um, shut me up, but I, I still sort of like had half my wits. It's about me. But for, like... 10, 15 seconds. I didn't know where, didn't know where I was with Vince Phillips, and um, it seems funny about that because I, I actually, you know, knocked him from pillar to post, you know, for the old 12 rounds, and I couldn't believe how come the end of the 12 rounds, the shots was with him, hitting him with, he was still in there, but yeah, that was absolutely without doubt. That was without doubt. Legs, you know, it's like you're dipping your toe in the swimming pool, but you can't find the water. It was, it was mad. You know, you mentioned there about. Um, used to be able to walk through the punches and that kind of stuff. Do you attribute any of not being able to walk through the punches to the life you led outside the ring? Absolutely, yeah. And I mean, because I mean, in the early years, uh, and Kerry Case said it to me on, on no news at times, but in the, in the early years, you know, you, you know, you're young, your body, you'll be able to rip the weight off. Do you know what I mean? You'll be able to, you know, you know, set the punches. But, you know, it's like... I think your punch resistance, and I have a view, and I don't know if most fighters think it. It's like you know when you chop a tree down. You know what I mean. You've either if you've not got a good chin, you know, you know, you, you know, you, you're going to go over. Simple as. But if you have got a good chin, you know what I mean. You can take them and you can come through them and that. But that don't last forever. Mm. You know, it's like chopping a tree down. You know, you don't chop a tree down in one stroke. You know, I think your, your career is a little bit like ding, 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 ding. And I think also the fact that how you look after yourself and look after your body, and then, I mean. I, you know, I made when I'm losing three stone. You know, not not in the in the early years when I was doing four rounders, six rounders, eight rounders, and all that. But finding, but when I when I got to championship level and I was only having three fights a year and bigger gaps in between, and I had to get three uh, three stone off every time. Kerry Casey, sooner or later your body will go. You know what I mean? It's a miracle I was able to get away with it for so long. But sooner or later, your body's going to turn the, and go, listen, you know, you've been doing this for years, mate. I've had enough of it now. Do you regret any of that? Do you think, you know, the, 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 the flip side that you could have done even more, been even better, trading off against who you were as a person I suppose I think I think I could have I think I could have done a little bit better but I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't swap anything I did for the world because at the end of the day four world titles in two weight divisions record crowds and you know best in me weight division ring magazine belts ring fighter of the year I mean you know when the still when not I bad, is yeah it? when still I first raised, placed my gloves on you know on, on Attersley you know you know in the boxing gym on, on Attersley you know when I was like 10 years of age if you just said, oh, in a few years, and I said, oh, you, you, 
you crackers or something. But, but no, I, I think, you know, as I'm a trainer now, all my trainers I train, they come in the gym, they get on the scales. They finish weighing, they get on the scales. If they've got, they have a fight and they've got a week off, they can't put any more than a certain amount of poundage on, you know, otherwise they're in trouble. And that's because um, I know that if I hadn't burnt the candle at both ends and that, who's, who's to know that I might have performed a little bit better against Mayweather, might have performed a bit better against Pacquiao. Who, who, would, who would have known? But the question you, you asked, asked me to answer, would have changed any of it? No, not of it. Now I'm a trainer. If they do what I did, I'll ring their necks, you know. So but do as I say, not as I do. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I wouldn't change it for anything but because I was the the little the little rum, you know, the little scally from Manchester. He's a rum, and look at him. He loses three stone every way. Look at him in the pub. Look at him here. Oh, look at him at the match there with a pint and a bob rule. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. We'll go and watch him. We'll go and watch him because he boxed me. Because that's I could relate to the 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 fans, the people that watch me. They, who come to support me, they could relate to me. I was just one of them. And that's why I think they support me. I had an exciting fight, an exciting fighting style. But I think they come, I'd like to think they come to watch me for the other, for the other stuff. So I wouldn't change it, anything for the world. I think that gave me the fan base and the following because I was a little uh, Manchester scallywag. I think that's why I had the fan base I did. But as far as Campbell and any of my other lads, you know, you know I manage Campbell now, but I don't train him. But I manage him and if he got up to that any of that caper or, or any of that no I would not uh, would not allow it but personally no wouldn't change you for the world back then there was talk about Kelson Pinto Miguel Cotto um, were either of those close um, I think um, it, I was signed to fight Kelson Pinto he was un, unbeaten he was a WBO champion and, and um, something went on with him a week a week um, week before the fight I think he, he pulled out injured and then a Dennis Pedersen um, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, stepped in which um, I don't think it was I mean I think I stopped him in six five or six if I remember but I don't think it was I didn't set any um, I didn't set any um, you know any, anyone's you know, air up or standing anyone's air standing up on the back of the neck with that, with that performance I boxed another guy called Wilfredo Vilches in my next performance it wasn't good and I think the fights were just getting a little bit too more as you mentioned earlier, Trish, you know, Ricky Atten, WBU, Mickey Van Referee, you know, I mean, it just got a little bit. And I think my performances, because I, I think I'd reached a, a, a level, and, and I, I, yeah, I thought I'd plateaued. And I think I thought, and Billy Graham said to, me, said to me, he said, Rick, what's happening here? You know, you're not, you know, you're not, you know, should be walking through these guys and that. And I think it's because I was ready for the, the, the bigger names, you know. So one of those bigger names was Arturo Gatti, who you went and saw in Atlantic City. What are your memories of Gatti? Well, I think my memories of Gatti is the memories like everyone's memories of him. What an exciting fighter. Was that a remember. dream fight for you? Was that one that you were desperate for? And did you guys talk about it when you, you met in a hotel room, didn't you? Yeah, I don't think it, I, was, I was desperate for it, but I think we were both at a, a period where I'd, I think I'd beat Costa Zoo. I might, I might be I think I might be right there. I think I beat Costa Zoo and he was fighting Mayweather and there's a talk if we both won what, what fight this would be. And, you know, I met him in Atlantic City and he said, oh, yeah, it'd be, be an honour to share the ring with you at all. He said, oh, likewise, Ricky, you fight against Costa Zoo. Styles make fights and, you know, it's a fair one. So I said, oh, listen, you get the job done against Floyd tonight if you can, you know. And that's so it was talked about. And obviously the Miguel Cotto fight was also... Uh, talked about because he was WBU champion he, he beat Paulie Malinaji didn't he you know for the WBU title um, but I think he was struggling massively at light welterweight and I think I he was WBO champion and I think I beat just beat Costa Zoo around about the same time so that's why it was uh, right. why it was talked about but I think he was struggling massive at the weight I think if I'd have boxed him at light welterweight I'd have, at, the, at the time when I beat Costa Zoo and he was uh, beat Malinaji. I think at that time, I think I'd have beat him. I think I'd, I wouldn't have said no problem, but I'd have definitely beat him. But Miguel Cotto's boxing legacy ended up as when he moved from the light welterweight division, wasn't it? When he moved to the welterweight and the light middleweight. So I mean, that's when I think we saw the the best of sure. of Miguel Cotto. But I think he was just trying too hard to keep his weight down for that light welterweight stage. And I think if he's struggling. You know, it's all like with Malinaji, who, as I mentioned, no disrespect, she was a bit of a light, light puncher and not a power merchant. 
if you're struggling at the weight, you didn't want to fight Ricky out and who beat Costa Zou. So I, I think that's why. But it, well, it was talked about. I mean, I don't really know what to say about the Costa Zou fight. That hasn't already been said because it's just, you know, one of the great nights in British sport. Um, what, what, what new can you say about it that's not been said? Anything? Well, it's nothing. It's just that, I mean, the fact that everyone, no one gave me a chance. Do you know what I mean? I think when the odds first started, it was, you know, I think it was like seven to one or something like that. It was for him to beat me, you know. And um, I always thought, you know, I thought, me and Billy said, no, we've got we've got the style to beat him. You know, I mean, let's let, we can, we we I think I was of the fact, and I think Billy was of the fact that listen, he can he could probably if he if someone who hits like that can knock any of us out at any time. You know, but I think if for some reason he doesn't get you in the first five four or five rounds, and you can go on him, you can bully him because he's old, a little bit older than me, and you know, can stay on his chest, bully him, push him about, and wait wait for him, take a little bit of. Um, sting from him, you know, let, let the sting out of his punches by sitting on his chest and, you know, a constant body attack. And as the rounds go on, if he gets a little bit weaker, then, weaker, then we can put our foot down and... Punch we, him in the nuts. Yeah, yeah, hit him in the bollocks, yeah. But I think... But we, we did we believe that we had the style to beat him, but we had to get through four to five first. Uh, but I don't think many people thought I would get through that four to, four to five. But that, that, that became my fuel... Because I believed I could beat him, and you know, I had the love of of the of the UK behind me, but not the the um, belief. Yeah, belief, you know, behind me, and I was, you know, which is nice to have the love, but the belief. And I was saying to Billy, you know, it's only me and two, me and you two think we can beat this fellow. It's only those two dickheads think we can beat him. But it doesn't matter. He says if we think we believe we can beat, we think we can beat him. We can beat him, you know. So. Um, and that's that's what it was, and they said it go down as the best win, one of the best wins in British boxing history, and it was uh, that's what it was. Best, best night, best night of my boxing life. Were you training at two a.m. to get ready for it? I was running, yeah, running at two o'clock in the morning, two two thirty in the, in the morning. Um, so you changed the structure of your day because yeah, of the time. Yeah, yeah, I just well, I'd normally train in the gym at midday or something like that, and then I'd do my running of an evening about seven eight o'clock. What I'd do, I would I would train tea time, do you know what I mean? You know, about five five six o'clock, and then I'd go running at two three o'clock in, in the morning. So all I'd do is move me 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 me, me day along, yeah. working day along, you know, to to How coincide long did you with do fight. That for? I did it did that for about three weeks. Two, I think, if I remember rightly, two or three weeks um, before the fight. You know, cause, I mean, I didn't have to do it for 12 months. I mean, uh, for 12 weeks, I beg your pardon. Sure, yeah. But, you know, for do it for two weeks, just so you can get your body ready for that. And I think Costia, um, I'm not saying Costia took me lightly, but um, he came over just like just like a week before from Australia. I don't know if you've ever been to Australia. It takes a whole lot out of you, you know what I mean? And he just trained normal time and stuff like that. And I, I, I don't know if he thought he was going to knock me out. Or this, this was an easy fight. Mm come to Manchester, this kid's just going to walk onto me and I'm going to go whack with my right hand. Um, so and I think the fact that we was thinking, if I can get through these four or five rounds, not only will he weaken with what I do in them first four, the fact that he's, he's, he's just got off a plane and he's not altered his, his training regime like we have and stuff like that, I think there's half a chance here. So I think it's half a, you know, and that's, for someone as experienced as as Costa Zoo, that I think I think that played a massive factor in the fight. That night, when you so picture yourself in the locker room that night when the music hits, and you know you're going to fight Costa Zoo. There are two types of people in this world: people who shit themselves and want to run away, and people who nod their head to the music and think, "I was born for this." It takes a special type of person to thrive in that environment, doesn't it? Oh yeah, it's night. I mean, don't forget, I've I got up for my breakfast in the morning and read all the national papers, and no one had me winning. No one had me winning. They all had me getting knocked out. So instead of thinking to myself, "Oh, oh shit, <laughs> I've got my hands full here tonight," I felt the opposite. I, I picked the papers and threw it down and thought, "Toss it." Do you know what I mean? That's why I actually, I actually thought, "I'll show you. I'll show you." And then when it was, you know, I don't know. If, the people will remember this, but I mean, I was, I got in the, got in the ring, I got into the music, and I took me, 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 um, me hood off me, off me gown straight away, 
And I looked in the crowd and I kept going up to the crowd and shouting, going, come on! And Costa Zoo, you know, must have, you know, I mean, it's all bollocks half the time, but I mean, Costa Zoo must have looked over and thought, gee, he must have heard the, the noise of the crowd and he must have looked in the crowd, because I did. I draw strength on looking at them Mancunians, and not just Mancunians, because the fans come from all over the, the, the country. Yeah. When I jump, look in the crowd and I look in their eyes and I scream at them and go, come on, let's have it! Like that, like that. You could see them look back at you. Mirror it. Yeah. Mirror. Mirror it, you know what I mean? They were all behind me. And then I'd look back and I'd be just stop stomping up and down, you know, and what Costa Zoom must have... And that first two rounds, I started really, really fast. And I think he, uh, I think he was taken a little bit surprised. I think he thought, it's not going to be as easy as I thought this. When they announce that you've won the fight, is it a blur now looking back at it? Or do you remember it, you know, no, second by second? I remember everything, everything, because I was sat on the corner and Billy said, we've got him here, Rick, now. We've hit him here now. And I was going, Billy, I'm knackered. Billy, I'm knackered. He went, I don't want to hear that, Rick. We knew we'd have to go through this pain barrier. Do you know what I mean? We know we knew that, you know, we could, if we're coming down the home straight, we might have our noses in front, but you've got, that's when you've got to put your foot down I went, oh, Billy, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then he went, come on, come on. And I was pat my gum shield out. And he was saying the right things. But come on, Ricky, we knew this moment, this moment come. We sat, used to sit on that step in Salford. You was having a brew and I was having a cigarette about talking and beating the best. I said, you what, this is that moment now where it's in your hands to do it. So I don't want to hear that. I went, right, right, give me a drink. Pour some water over me. I went, right, right, come on. I just was a... Just as I went like that, Billy turned around and he went, I think they're stopping it, Rick. I went, what? And they went, I think they're stopping it. And they stopped him. Billy dropped the, the, the sponge and we hugged each other. And I, I, was, I didn't have much energy left myself, to be honest. I was knackered. I fell down and I started, uh, started crying. And um, it was unbelievable. You know, to win a world title is, is something, I mean, really special to win a world title. But to be the best out of all the champions in your weight division to be the best fighter in the weight division and someone who was, you know, a pound for pounder, you know, up there in the, the top of the pound for pound, probably one of the greatest light like, welterweights of, that, of, of, of all time, you know, to stop him and for him to be on his stool, you know, even if I hit him with one of my body shots and knocked him out, it could never be as good as a formidable fighter like Costa Zou sitting on his stool and go, no, no more, I've had, a, I've had enough and... Uh, I remember absolutely everything, and to, for a Mancunian to win that fight of that size in Manchester, do you know what I mean? It's, uh, I think it's one that I don't think we'll, they'll, they'll be talking about for, forever. In terms of Costa Zou, he didn't fight again, so there's now some revisionism saying, oh, he was over the hill. Does that bother you? No, not not People at all. weren't a, saying it before. Not obviously. at all, they weren't saying it before, and that, that's... that's, that's that's the keyboard warriors and that's the, you know, you'll always get people that will never, people yeah, time. you'll always, you know, that's something you've, you've got to deal with and they all thought me, and, you know, not me out, I mean, he was, I mean, you know, there's one thing, you know, some fighters, you know, they're better when they're fresher, some fighters are better when they're, they're ex, you know, they've got more experience behind him, some fighters in history have been better the, the older they've got. Billy, I come from a gym where fighters such as Steve Foster uh, Senior, Steve the Viking he started off as a bit of a journeyman in his career, and as his career went better, he got he got way better. He won the the world uh, the Commonwealth title against Chris Pyatt, and then fought Winky Wright for the world title. Ensley Bingham the same. He got old, better as the older he went. He you know was a Lonsdale winner at what thirty four years of age. Cal Thompson used to lie about his age like mad, but Cal Thompson I think was about thirty six <laughs> years of age when he beat Chris Eubank for that. So. So, uh, no, I, I, I'm not going to have that. I think, you know, everyone's in, entitled to their opinion. But, you know, no, he was, he was knocking out. He was not, not as active because of his, a few of his injuries. But then when he did fight, he was blasting everyone. Sure. Nobody expected me to beat him because of my, my style and his style. But, no, some fighters, some fighters, as they get older, they go worse. Some get better, though. So career-wise, you I don't want to get too legal on this, but you left Frank here uh, after he pushed the boat out to get Costa Zoo over, uh, and you joined Dennis Hobson. You're close to Dennis now, but you've also said you wish you hadn't left Frank. If you could do that bit of your career again, would you do it differently? 
Um, it's hard to say, you know, with the career that I, that I had, the relationship that I have with Dennis now and Frank, which is solid gold, you know what I mean? But at the time, um, when I beat Kostya Zhu, um, it, you know, I thought, you know, it's the time, you know, because I, I, in my mind, I, I, I think it was the payday I took for Kostya Zhu to come to Manchester, you know, and fight me in my backyard. He had to, you know, he had to get the lion's share. He had to get the lion's share, which I agree with. But if you beat him, that's when you kick on. Kick on. And I didn't feel that that was that showed him this is what you're going to get for your next one. I went, hang on a minute. What, what did you, you? What happened with you know? You give him the lion's <laughs> share, and then once you beat him, then that, then you get that. And I just don't think it reflected. So. That's why we uh, we ended up leaving, you know, to to Dennis, leaving and going to Dennis, and Dennis did a fantastic job with the fights that he did for me. And um, but it's like I, I never, I can, I can never. For I like to think I'm a genuine person, you know, sincere person, and I, I, and that's why I'm friends with Dennis now. That's why I'm friends with Frank now. I think these, that's why I'm friends with Amy McGee now. That's why I'm friends with Junior. You know, I can't stay fell out with with people. And when I I speak to Dennis and I speak to Frank Warren, I speak about. Some of the great, some of the greatest times of my career was with Frank. Some of the greatest times of my career was with Dennis. You know what I mean? And sometimes in the it, back then things, it's the way it sometimes goes. Really, you had a really good tough run of fights here, where you you beat Mauser with one of the great left hooks. Uh, you got to welterweight to fight Colazo in a fight that Billy didn't want you to have. You fight Juan Arango when you got a cold, but you still get through him in Vegas. And then there was Jose Luis Castillo on a, one of the best. Hatton Vegas nights. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, I mean, um, he was um, he was actually in the pound for pound rankings. To to be honest with you, I think um, he was in and there about ten, I think, at the time or something like that. And um, everyone's seen uh, Jose Luis Castillo. He put the fights he put up against Mayweather, the fights with Diego Corrales. You know what I mean? I think the fact that his style and my style, <laughs> it was it was only going to be one thing, and it was like a real. Um, close quarter battle you know body punching in close a lot of grappling when i mean a lot of grappling still punching while you're grappling you know we're working inside sitting in the pocket and working joe cortez was happy that night to let it <laughs> to let it flow and let it let it and let it go on but um but no and, and you know to win the fight with a body punch against someone who's traditionally known as as a body puncher in his own right you know and, and a mexican Mexicans are known for being, you know, body punches and fighting in close. And so to sort of like beat him at his, his own game a little bit and to, to beat it with a body shot, probably the best body shot. I've thrown a lot of body shots in my, in my career, but just the, probably the best one I've thrown. Maybe, maybe the best punch of my whole career. I mean, the Mauser punch was a, a spectacular, you know, one of them you'd see from the back row, wouldn't you? But I mean, the the, the actual placement of to do it and to, 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 to for it to do, Okay. The damage it did to the person it did, I think that would go down as me, me best punish. I mean, a lot of people said that Jose might have been a little bit, you know, past his best. That might might be right, but they said a lot of people turned around and said, well, you know, he would have never gone down from a body shot like that, you know, a few years ago. This was at the press conference, and Bob Aram took to the mic and said, uh, that's being disrespectful to Ricky. It was a perfect body shot. We had him, we had his ribs X-rayed, and. Uh, Apparently, Ricky cracked two of his ribs with the one shot, so uh, it was the perfect body shot. And um, to say that, you know, Jose, you know, went down a little bit weaker because he's just seen, seen better days. I think, I think that's disrespectful to Ricky and disrespectful to, to Jose. I think, I think we'd all go down if we had a rib cracked, or two ribs cracked, if you like. So that's, uh, yeah. Um, Dennis said around this time he was trying to get a deal for you to fight Corrales. Did you know about that? And was that a fight that was close? Um... You know, we talked about Arturo Gatti and, and Miguel Cotto and, and Diego Corrales. I think, um, when you think of all the fighters, well, them three mainly, I fought the majority of them. But those were the three that just got on the radar. I think they were always mentioned and, you know, I think they were always, I think whether it be whether it be Frank or whether it be Dennis or whether it be Oscar, I think they were all at some point, you know, you know, you go for him. He might not be available because he's already got a fight, so we'll give him a try. And you know, but he's he's fight, he's already penciled in to fight him. And you know, they you know sometimes you know, it's not for when you fight when you fight to like Corrales and Cotto and Gatti and like myself, they don't happen because we don't want him. It happens because it's just sometimes it just politics you, you, yeah politics and you just miss the ship. You know what I mean? Um, 
you left Dennis then and did the Mayweather deal. Um, how easy was it to do the Mayweather deal and why, why no longer with Dennis? Um, I thought, you know, to be honest with you, I didn't. Um, I was rocking on with the boxing and, and other, other people handled my, my, um, my affairs. I don't know whether it was, listen, it was a case of Golden Boy running the show and that was it, no question, or Golden Boy and Mayweather running the show and, and this, that. You know, it's a, it's a long time ago and I, it's hard for me to, I, don't, I can't comment because I don't really know that it's been that long ago. I can't really remember sure. if, the, if the truth be known. But, um, but well, no, it did take a long time to, to get, the, the, get it over the, the, the finishing line. And I will always be grateful for the, the opportunity of, of fighting Mayweather because I was a light welterweight. You know what I mean? It wasn't like I was a mandatory. I had to fight him. It, just, it was just the obvious fight you know I, we were both unbeaten I was exciting I was from you called him out as well after Castillo yeah I called him out after Castillo so I mean that's the the fight I wanted you know and that's a fight that I thought with my style my swarming style and my pressure and everything like that I thought if anyone can beat him I've got half a chance and um, but it took a it took a while to, to get it done. But listen, any fight of that stature, any fight of big fights, listen, you know, Tyson Fury and AJ is, is a prime example, you know what I mean? When you're trying to get, you know, such a big fight, such a big fight with big names, there's no one particular reason. It takes a little bit longer to get it over the over the line, yeah. The press tour was great for that, you and Floyd. Did you get to him? Did he get to you? I don't know. I think I got to, both. I think I got to him when um, I was in Manchester. Because when I you turned the air blue on Sky Sports News. Then, yeah, when, I, when I, nobody told me it was going live on Sky Sports News, so I was putting a few, uh, you know, a few Fs and a few Jeffs, and that maybe I shouldn't. And the fellow behind the camera was going, hey, kid, "Stop swearing, we're live." And um, but I thought I was doing one of my after dinners, to be honest with you, because I thought I've been to New York, you know, I've been to Los Angeles, I've been to Michigan, which was where Floyd was was born. I've been to Las Vegas, I've been to Los Angeles, and I've had to put up with all this crap from him. Give me, come on, give me some of that face-to-face -face stuff, you know, and it's not me. Oh, I've got 250 on me pinky, I've got 250,000 around me waist, look at you, and everything like that. And I, I just, just, I think that's why the 24-7 works so well, because, you know, it, it Floyd's Floyd, and I'm me, and we were just totally two different, different things. But, I mean, he... he he didn't get up into my skin on the 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 twenty um, the twenty four seven. Not one bit. I believe I got under his skin because I, at Manchester when I was test doing me stand up and <laughs> taking a Mickey out of him, Oscar De La Hoya phoned me on the and when I said they were on the train going back to London, they said, "Oh, Floyd's spitting feathers here." Said you've disrespected him. I've <laughs> I've disrespected Floyd Mayweather. I went, "That's the best joke we've heard we've heard today." Never mind what I was doing, but no, he. Um, it didn't upset me. It didn't upset me on the 24-7. I think the only time he, he, he probably... I don't think he upset me, got under my skin. I think he, I got myself a little bit too wound up at the weigh-in, you know, when I went nose-to-nose, face-to-face -face with him. We were literally face-to-face, -face, and he just leaned an inch, and I thought, I'm not giving even half an inch here. So now I put my head on him, and then I got the mic. I said, let's have him. Come on, you know, and all you know, that. And it, it wasn't him getting under my skin. I think I got myself a little bit too fired up you know, so. so tell anyone watching, whether it's young fighters or, or anyone with those sort of aspirations to get to that level, what's it like being an A-lister in Vegas on fight week or when you've got a camp in Vegas? How many doors open to you? Ah, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's the stuff that, you know, I could have never, never have dreamed of. And I mean, even when... You know, what like? Do you have to pay for anything? Do you have to put your hand in your pocket for anything? Or no, yeah, it's not quite like that. But I mean, you know, you know, you could, you can, you can, you can phone up the hotel and and you know and sort of like put your name, you know, for the for the for the guest list on the nightclub or, you know, Tom Jones, you know, he's, he's playing in concert, you know, kind of. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I got um, um, Tom Jones one time. Me, 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 my girlfriend at the at the time, my ex. Um, we walk, we come back in, and we went, oh, Tom Jones is playing. This was, it wasn't a fight weekend. We just went for a holiday. We went, oh, Tom Jones is, is playing, because Tom, Tom sung the national anthem at the, the Mayweather fight. So um, I went, oh, Tom Jones is playing. So I turned around and said, oh, uh, my name's Mr. Hatton from Room, what's the name, what's the name? Is there any tickets left for the um, Tom Jones concert? Oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's all, it starts in about three hours' time, so it's, it's sold out. So I went, oh, no problem, no problem. Um, 
and the next minute, you know, we we went got some something to eat, went back up to the room, and there was like tickets under the door, and it was um, I think he was called Mr. Stern, and he did the public relations at oh, yeah, uh, the Richard M Stern, Richard yeah, Stern, yeah. did the relations at um, the MGM Grand. He said, Ricky, he said, in the history of the MGM Grand, we never took as much money as we did on the Ricky Hatton Floyd Mayweather fight weekend, whether it be over the bar, over the casino, and as long as you're in this hotel, he said, you won't have to pay for anything for any ticket. I thought. Wow, and I mean, for the kid, you know, I mean, if in Manchester, in your hometown, but not halfway across the world, in Vegas, where, God, you know, you'd walk down the strip and just every star in, in the world's name's up in light. So for, for the little kid from Attersley Council Estate to, to receive something like that, you know, I had to go to the bar, I didn't get free drinks at the bar everywhere I went, the type thing, but I mean, whenever they was able... If it, if it was to get in a nightclub or go here or book a restaurant or go this, it was never never a problem. And from it's that's an achievement in itself. What's been your most surreal night out in Vegas? My most surreal night out in Vegas, I think um, a few off the uh, off the top of my head. I remember one time we went out with Mike Tyson. There was a, a lad gentleman called Joe Sharp who used to work for uh, Caesar's Palace, and he used to do the p public relations there. And I went over on holiday there one time and I went out for a night out with Mike Tyson. Uh and that was um that was that was something else just to you know, to be with around going out with Mike Mike Tyson, you know, and doors opened up then. You know, it was it, yeah. I mean uh, I've had so many I mean it's hard not what to would you guys go what did you do? Go for a meal or did you no, go to No, we went out clubs? and had a pint in clubs. <laughs> yeah. Did you? Yeah, it was brilliant, yeah. And uh, I, I, I think I, I can say Mike was, Mike's not in the nice place he was now. I mean, he was, he, don't get me wrong, he was, he was, he was, he was sound on that night, pleasant, and it was an absolute honour, you know, just the, some of the things we're talking about, but to go and have a night out with Mike Tyson was you know, summer, summer else. But um, he was he was a little bit quiet, seemed a little bit subdued for Mike, which, you know, is, but, I mean, but uh, I think he was, you know, it takes a long time, you know, and I know more than anyone, you know, from where you've been on rock bottom, you know, to, to get into where I am today. And you look at where Mike is, is today. I think he was, uh, I think he was on the mend, but I don't, sure. but, He's you know, already, not, not, not where he is. And it's lovely to see where he is uh, present day loving life and everything yeah great um you and floyd arguably took each other to new levels of fame you won't like the word fame uh i know you still have a lot of old friends around you still obviously from where you grew up and all that kind of stuff but you are a celebrity how hard has that been over the years and being having that role where you you can't go out and not be recognized um it's not bothering me that 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 much. On a certain occasions, when I used to, you know, you go out with your girlfriend and you're having a meal and they come and ask you at the table, I think sometimes, I mean, if my say Roberto Duran was having a meal or or, 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 some, or just someone, you know, like me, I'd I'd, I'd sort of like I'd wait till they finished the meal and I'd wait and then I'd ask. But some people just have no. I mean, I remember I went to Tenerife one time and you know I was you know me me ex was pregnant at the time and I was trying to search him round to get her for a seat and I'd be saying to people please just uh, let me get my girlfriend a seat please look she's pregnant oh come on Rick you're going to ruin our holiday and you know think I think steam had come out my ears my girlfriend's pregnant you ruin your holiday we're on holiday you know what I mean and stuff like that but you know in the big picture of, of things I've, I mean, it's because I've always had time for people I've never really, tur I've never turned a picture down ever in in my life, and I always give time for people, and I think that's why I had the the support. Um, I I did, and I think, I think, cause of cause of that, I think everyone's already had the picture now, so I think that's why I'm <laughs> all right. To, but I mean, if I said to one people, no, I'm busy, I'm having a meal, oh, well, stop it like that, you know, then you know, then when that person tells one mate, and then they tell that mate, and they tell that mate, and before you know it, you get a reputation as a dickhead. And I think uh, I'd like to think there's not too many people out there who's, who's come across me or asked me for a picture or or anything like that will refer to me as a dickhead. I mean, I've had me, I have my moments like we all do, and uh, over the years, and I've had some downtimes and stuff like that. But for all in all, I think I'm a good egg. You know. There's so much that we could obviously touch upon, you know, in terms of your life and career. Obviously, there was Lascano, uh, Malignaggi, the move to Mayweather Senior, all this stuff, obviously leaving Billy um, and that kind of stuff. 
it's just it's just phenomenal. I did want to obviously speak about your old mate Pacquiao as well. In terms of the Pacquiao fight, how a, a did you feel that shot, the shot that did it, and B, how much did that send you over the edge, that defeat? Because you said that when we did War and Peace <coughs> together, you said that you you sort of started to notice depression creeping in post Mayweather. Did Pacquiao send you over the edge? Uh, yeah, I think Pacquiao sent me over the edge. Um, and then shortly after Pacquiao, um, I fell out with my mum and dad, uh, which I think that was the one that was the real um, that was the real killer for me. Um, but it's accumulation of things. I mean, a lot of people say, "Oh, it's Mayweather that got beat. Why are you so? Why are you, why are you bothered? You know, he's Mayweather, and you got your biggest payday. You know, I I went there and I thought I could beat him. I thought, you know, listen, you know, I'm not going to beat him on speed. I'm not going to beat him on." Um, ability or anything like that the only thing i will do him is on punch volume and i think if i'm allowed to get close and punch i'll throw more punches than him 100 percent. and i think you know i didn't get the i didn't get the, the the chance to you know so i mean i was i was i was down after that and then i uh, decided to make a comeback against lascano and the fifty-five thousand at city manager stadium so I was up brilliant and then um I just a party company with Billy Graham, not for anything. He's he's, he's um, an exceptional trainer, the best, the absolute best by a mile I've ever I've ever ever worked with. But he was having a lot of injuries at the time, needles in his hands, needles in his elbows to get through. And you know when when he was when when I was fighting, say Faxton for instance, or Costa Zoo, you know, when we'd be on the body belt, you know, the the jab would be boom, ping, ping where because of the elbows it was coming a little bit, you know what I mean, and a little bit slower. And, and it's not not Billy's fault, it was just what you call father time, because don't forget before Ricky Hatton come along, there was Kyle Thompson, Ensley Bingham, there was all the Champs Camp boys, Frank Grant, Paul Burke, then they had Morris Core, then he had Paul, Andy, Paul Burke, um, Andy Oligan, Kyle Thompson, Ensley Bingham, Steve the Viking Foster, he, you know, and he's just body had given up with him. So I thought, if I'm going to continue with my career, because my performance against Lascano wasn't red hot, I thought, you know, I need, you know, might be another trainer. He might not be as good as Billy Graham, but if I, I'd rather, you know, 100% of someone than, sure. you know. So that, that's why me and Billy... Um, Fell out at the, at the at the time, and then I, then I, you know then the Pacquiao fight come, um, sorry the Malinaji fight come, which was a great performance. So then me, me frame of mind was back up. Then the Pacquiao defeat come, did not out in two rounds, which consequently meant I had to retire. So then I was down again, and then I fell out with my You can fell out. So you mean me frame of mind? You know, you know, I, I've got B. Oh no, I've won again, fifty thousand. Oh, I've got B. No, I've won. I'm not. And before you know it, and then when I fell out with my mum and dad, I, um, it was, you know, I thought to myself, God, the I, news I, of the world sting as well. Yeah, they had the news of the world sting, you know, as well. To be honest with you, and but like I say, when that come about, I was a very, very poorly person. My head was. Was was not right, and I really had it for a for a few years. It was a real difficult difficult time for me, and I you know I was I was going for a night out, me, and I was thinking, well, of Billy Graham, you know, it was love and was more than a trainer, was like a mate, you know. I don't celebrate it with Billy now because we've had a fallout, you know, and my mum and dad, it, it were my mum and dad, you know, and they've been there from day one. I don't speak in them to two, you know, so I can't share it with Billy. I can't share it with my mum and dad. I haven't got boxing no more because Pacquiao's knocked me out. What am I doing? What, what am I here for? What's the point? You went to a couple of places for help, the Priory and Sporting Chance. Did you get much out of going to those places? Uh, I, I think I got more out of Sporting Chance. I mean, the Priory, I think the um, it was like being class and everyone doing the same work where the Sporting Chance was more everyone... As their own, everyone, everyone's individuals, aren't they? You know, we all, you know, we all got different problems. We all have to deal it in a in a in a different way. Where they'd even, you know, in in the prior, I felt they told they told you the rules before they'd even got to know you. You know, you know, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Don't you want to ask me <laughs> who I am, what it's I do for a living, what I do? They, you know, yeah, they yeah. go in there and it's like, you know, it's like, you know. You've got to be, you're, you're the, you're an alcoholic or you're the drug thing and that's it. And that, you know, and I, and I thought, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You, you know, don't you want to ask a few questions? Were you an alcoholic? No. Have you been one? No. I've has, drunk. Has, has drink 
got out of control for you before? Very much so. But I would turn around and say it's a it's a it's a frame of mind more than more than anything. Than you know, I mean, if I when I was in it, you know, it's like now I can go out and have a have a drink because I'm in a nice place, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, with the, the family and Campbell turning pro and the kids and everything like that. I can go and have a nice drink, a couple of drinks, and come back home. No, when I was thinking, I mean, I had a drink. All I could think about years ago was me was Billy, my mum and dad. You know, I'm never gonna wear. There's only one Ricky out and ever again. I'm never gonna be going to Vegas again. See my names up in life. So. Drinking with that in your mind and drinking with what I have present day in my mind, it's different. It's different. Do you know what I mean? I'm a happy drunk now where I, <laughs> 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 yeah, where I used to be. No, it used to be. It was, it was, I was on the warpath. Not on a warpath in the sense that, you know, people around me were in jeopardy. I mean, me mentally in there and there. Yeah. I, was, I was on a, you know, because, I mean, I, I couldn't slip my wrist. I thought I will drink myself to death. I yeah. drug myself to death. Right, I'm not going to take too much more of your time, but I do appreciate you making the time to speak to us. I did want to ask you this. So obviously I sent you a book the other day, Damage, which is about CTE and boxing, what used to be punch drunk syndrome and that, and that kind of stuff back in the day. Um, a, do you have any concerns about it? And B, do you know that there's links with uh, brain trauma to depression and that kind of stuff? So therefore, you know, when we talked about you, Frank, Tyson, and other guys that have suffered, it could be linked to brain trauma, or then it could just be linked to the stuff that you talked about, identity change, you know, from boxers. I'm open-minded to think it could be a number of uh, a number of things. You know what I mean? You're under so much uh, pressure, you know, through your through your boxing, and your body goes through so much, you know, physical uh, damage over the years with taking taking punches, and the fact that you know. The people will never understand when that bell rings and it's just you in there with your opponent. The, the, the mental pressure, the, not only the physical pressure, but the mental pressure you're, you're under. You know, I mean, it's, it is absolutely unbelievable. And, you know, and you've got to, you know, you have your trainer, you have your manager, you have your promoter. But nine times out of ten, when that bell rings, it's just you and you alone you've got to rely on. So it is a very, very stressful thing. And when you have things going on with your personal life, and also I think... There's not like a, a professional footballers association in boxing like they have in the football and that. You know, it's pretty much like they are. There's your fight, right? You've retired now. Good luck. All the best. And some people don't know how to cope with life after boxing. You know, with, with looking after your finances or looking after your health or this. You sort of like right, left. The yeah, you, yeah. You're left on your own to sort of like make, well, you know, help yourself. And me and Frank have spoke about this on many occasions that you know if you could get somewhere in boxing and say listen you know i don't know what to do with my money don't know how to look after my money what am i going to do now because don't forget boxers nine times out of ten you know the average people retires at 50 55 60, whatever city yeah. something like That's, that yeah, yeah. what the boxers retire at 34 and the money have got to last them for that for that for that time and you know and it's like Boxers don't come from Cambridge and Oxford. We come from council estates. We're not used to money. We're not used to, you know, with what What do we do after having that? There's only one Ricky Hatton to, to being 34 years of age. So obviously, what do we do now? It's all gone. Yeah. It's very, very hard. And that's, I think that, I think it all, it's all, it's all the same. It's the pain and the, you know, the, the, the physical and mental strength you go through actually in the ring when you're fighting. And then when you come back, when you retire, and then if you've got personal things going on, I think it's all connected. And I think if there's an organisation where can help people cope with it, I think we've got half a chance. You're hugely fortunate that you got the, f the financial cushion that you had from boxing. I say fortunate, you weren't at all, obviously. Yeah, but, you know, I, I, had, I had good people around me to revise me where, advise me where to put it and what to do, what to do with this. And, I mean, I still like to... I still train fighters to the day. I still go out and do my speaking. I, you know, I still do appearances a little bit here and there where... You know, well, little bits coming in here and here and there, but I mean, ultimately, it's with a fighter. It's when you retire, you've got to you, that's got to live you for the rest of your life. And yeah. some, you know, a lot of people are not as fortunate as me. And imagine, you know, you know, and that's why so many times we hear about boxers that have made the the fortune, and then they've got nothing because they don't know what to do with it because there's no one there to tell them because, you know. Um, okay, so quick fire ones here. Biggest regret? Ooh, biggest, uh, biggest regret? I think not looking after myself a bit better. 
biggest night? Biggest night? Not on the piss, but biggest night. Biggest night, oh, cost you zoo. Cost you zoo without, without a doubt. Most famous pal? Most famous pal? Uh, I'd like to think David Beckham would call me a pal. I don't see him on m m you know on um, too many occasions now and don't really speak to him on the phone too much, but there was a little short period in there where we were good pals. Uh, best thing you've bought? The best thing I've bought? Um, I don't know. I think the best thing I've bought, I've always been a big Elvis fan and Johnny Cash fan, but I think, you know, I've got a signed autograph there by Elvis on one of the posters and Johnny Cash got signed autograph by um, Johnny Cash there. I thought, I thought, certainly as far as my memorabilia goes and also the three wheel van that I've got, you know, outside. I never... Uh, Never tired of getting in that and having a toodle with that every now and again, yeah. Bit of overlap. Prize possession? Prize possession. Um, Campbell, Millie, Fern, Lila. Oh, you can't say I thought you were going to say War and Peace. What? The war and <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That? yeah, that's that's a close fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Joe Cortez since the Mayweather fight? I did do, yeah, actually, to be honest with you. Did um, you hug him? <laughs> no, 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 no. I... Um, it was hard, you know, I come out, they had a VIP reception, reception and I come out and there was all the champions in there. Talk about a kid in a suite. It was at the WBC convention at the Mirage and we're all there, Dicky Bowles, Evander oh, Holy. Yeah, yeah. You, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. Evander Holyfield, Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto Duran, yeah, Joe yeah. Kawasaki, everything. And when I come out, I think Floyd Mayweather was walking with four of his bouncers. He had his trackie on, didn't he? He was getting an award like that. I thought, what a dick. But... Um, but yeah, that was, um, and I showed your kids, and he come up to me and went, how are you doing, champ? And I just, I just, I just shook his hand and didn't say no. I just went, Joe, I mean, to be honest, like, that's all about being in the right frame of mind. Yeah. You know, like for the Mayweather fight, Pacquiao fights, he used to put me head away, and Joe Cortez, if he'd have come up to me a few years ago, I would have probably put his head away, but uh, now I'm in a better place, yeah. Uh, ben Law asks this, by ballooning up in weights, did you feel that... Uh and having to go on more brutal weight cuts, did it take anything away from your fight night? I think, obviously, you've alluded there, overall, in terms of longevity, it did. Actually, on a fight night, do you think it probably didn't help, did it? Uh, no, it probably didn't help, but I always... People used to think, oh, he must have struggled to do that, and Kerry Case would, would agree with me this. Never struggled to make that 10 stone, because we used to do it over 12, 13 weeks or whatever, you know, which obviously... Well, to compensate so we could bring it down perfect with remaining the, with my stomach, stamina levels the same and my strength levels the same and my conditioning and work rate and everything the same. You can't, if you do it wrong, if you, do, if you bring your free stone off and do it too rushed or too quick or too slow, that's when the problem was. I was very fortunate to, I was dedicated enough to be able to do it perfectly and that's why I was able to remain with the most stamina. The, my conditioning was to, to be like it, like it was. But I mean, like you say, Longe longevity wise it's, it's not going to last forever Max Lewis do you regret fighting Pacquiao no not at all I um, I think me me training ok well, you said obviously about training camp so just reword that do you regret going through with that fight and not postponing it no uh, I'd, I'd 100% agree with, with going through with the fight I wish I'd have said to Floyd Mayweather three weeks out from the fight or four weeks out from the fight, give me a week off here because, down, yeah, yeah, because, because you know, you, you were, were flattening the battery here. Stuart Ellis, um, was the Junior Witter fight ever even close to being signed? I think it was close at one stage. When I beat John Faxton, um, Junior stuck his head in between the interview, didn't he? And uh, I'll knock you out and this, that, which I thought to myself was at the time. I don't know, maybe Junior thinks the same, the height of band managers, because me and his gym mate have just put a right war in, and he's come in and said, I'll flatten you in this, and I said to Frank Warren, you know what I mean, let's get that fight on, let's get that fight on, and it, uh, it never happened. I went WBU champion, and Junior sort of like just stayed there a bit, so we, we lost our chance, I think. There was a chance later on down the line, when he was WBC and all the rest of it, where it could have done good business. Yeah, but, but you, can't, you seem to want to spite him. It's a bit like the Carl Brook thing. Yeah, did yeah. You see similarities? Yeah, there? I did do because you know, I didn't need Junior at the time. I didn't need Junior Witter, and that's, and that's not being disrespectful to. You see the to. similarities with Carl and Brook. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Norman Barton, last one. Main road is open again for one night only for you to fight anyone 140 to 147 pounds from the 70s onwards. Who would it be, and how does it go? <laughs> I would say uh, Roberto Duran, because Roberto Duran was me, me hero. 
and it would always be, you know, nice to, to share the ring with my hero, just so you could see firsthand just how good your hero actually was. And if you're asking me how uh, how you think it went, I think it fucking fill me in. <laughs> 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 Ricky, it's a privilege to know you as I do, and, and thank you so much for your time. I'm Lo very grateful. Yeah, loved it, Trish. Thank, thank you, you mate. so much, mate. Oh, top man. Yeah, Thanks, loved mate. that. Enjoyed it, mate. It's good. It's so hard, mate. When you when we start talking about those big nights, and I think I've you must be bored to death doing yeah. some of that stuff. And no, so right, it's you like try and think of a different I question. Enjoy, I enjoy talking about it now. I mean, I, I, you know, if you, I couldn't, when I was going through my bad times, I could never do that. And I, I'd have to say, no, 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 